Hi. All right, guys, I am here with Dr. Judy Ho. She is the author of a book called Self-Sabotage. She's a former co-host of the show, The Doctor. She is a professor at Pepperdine University. She brings meaning to the new phrase, a Judy of all trades. Because uh, she, is, she is a jack of all trades, but yeah, now the saying goes, a Judy of all trades, because she truly um, is so well-rounded and has so many skill sets and has done so much. So I'm um, really excited to unpack um, as much as we can. And of course, we'll, we'll dive into her Instagram related content too. She's at Dr. Judy Ho and she's about 34,000 followers. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And last so, year at the same time, I was just at 10,000. So it's very exciting. Last time I checked, you were at like 20. So yeah, every time I check, like I can just go refresh the page and there's another thousand on there. So that's awesome. But um, she's been a longtime listener of the podcast. And a good friend of mine, we've kept in uh, contact over the last couple of years here, um, year and a half or so, and uh, decided to have her on the show finally, because uh, Judy, I actually uh, bought your book here, as yes. you can see. So um, I got to say, like, I could not put this thing down last night. The cover is such a nice texture. I just sat there watching a movie holding it. Uh, for two hours. No, I'm just kidding. But no, I read the book as much as I could last night and got a lot of great value out of it. And we'll surely be finishing it. But um, there's there's my long intro for you. <laughs> Judy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Derek. Fan of the show. I've listened to every single one of your episodes. And I was an early adopter. I think I found your podcast maybe when you were like only 10 episodes in. So went back and listened to all of it. And I really appreciate all the value that you're putting out there. I definitely put some of your tips to work on my Instagram profile. Yeah, just to start us off, I, I normally start with like an origin story. I feel like we, there's so many different directions we can go with this because you do so much. So let's just kind of get an overview of like what's active in your life right now. What are the things you're most excited about? Okay, so I'm a clinical and forensic neuropsychologist and I really do wear a lot of different hats in my professional world. I'm a professor. I have a private practice where I see patients and I also do expert witness work in civil and criminal cases. I am a researcher and I have a research lab. I'm a published author. I'm a podcast host and I work as an expert psychologist on TV and I host and co-host TV shows. And so I have- And you sing and dance. Yeah, and I sing and dance. And I've also started to learn magic again. <laughs> So I don't know, you know, I feel like I, there's so many things that interest me. There's so many things that I'm passionate about. Clearly psychology is at the core of all of that, but without the balance of like other things that we love to do to rejuvenate and recharge us, you wouldn't be able to pour all you can into your work. And I think I'm just somebody who really liked to have variety in my life. And so I really enjoy the fact that my career and what I've built is something where I can do all of these different things and basically reach all different kinds of audiences. And really the only way that you can have the guts to, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do this. It sounds like you don't really have much fear holding you back when it comes down to taking on something new. Is that right? Yeah. You know, and I think about why that's the case because people sometimes ask me, well, how can you just do that? And I think some of it is like blind confidence. Like sometimes you, you it's like you don't know failure because you haven't thought that much about what mistakes you could make. You just jump in and you just do it uh -huh. and out along the way and you make mistakes along the way and you learn from them and it's not a big deal. Um, but I also think some of that came from my parents. You know, my parents um, are immigrants. They moved from Taiwan to America and they basically built their careers from scratch here. And I don't think I could do that. They moved here when they were in their thirties. And I'm thinking about myself in my thirties, I'm not going to be doing anything like that. Like I'm so comfortable in America. I don't want to pack up and move to a different country and learn a different language, but that's what my parents did. And they really worked from the ground up. You know, they, they came to America with $200 in their pocket and now they're doing much better. And I think that just seeing how much they take risks and how hard they work, it really instilled those values in me and told me that I could do the same. Were they entrepreneurs? Oh, yeah. My parents um, started so many businesses, and now they are really, for the last 40 years, they've been really steeped in real estate. They have their own real estate company. They have over 100 employees, um, and my dad is a broker and a developer, and my mom handles both the sales and the loan side of the business. So they work together. They work together every day, and they've, uh, they've been entrepreneurs all their life. 
So you've always had the good work role models around you. You've certainly developed a lot of your own mentality, um, well, you know, top level mentality from reading this book. Um, it really shows that you're an expert, obviously, at stopping self-sabotage, and that goes for you yourself, which it's probably easier to teach people to stop self-sabotage than it is to, to teach yourself, even for you, would you say? Absolutely. I think that self-sabotage is universal. I think we all do uh -huh. You know, but some people, maybe they find that they're trapped by it more than other people, but no, everybody does it. And I think in my twenties, my biggest version of self-sabotage was procrastination. And I think the procrastination comes from a place where you're misinformed. You think that if you push something off to later, that maybe you're actually going to be better at it. Like, oh, I just need all that extra motivation. And then I'm going to put out my best work. But then you didn't leave yourself enough time to actually do your best work. So I've been burnt a few times and then stopped doing that. But I would say that in my 20s, that's where I would see myself getting stuck. It's like, oh, sometimes I would procrastinate so much. Why do I do that? when I knew that that project was due 20 days ago and here I am pulling an all-nighter and trying to get it all done in the last 24 hours. So in your 20s, you didn't quite have it yet. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I think that that's really the message of the book is you shouldn't feel ashamed if you feel like you self-sabotage. Sometimes everybody uses that word and it could be in your relationships, it could be in your career, it could be in all kinds of stuff, maybe adopting a healthy habit, but we all do it from time to time. So don't blame yourself, but start solving the problem. Think about how you can actually approach the problem in a proactive way. And that's what my book is all about. It's based in science and it's six steps on how you can eradicate self-sabotage from your life for good. And it's been really wonderful getting to write the book because it really made me reflect a little bit on my own journey, but also thinking about all the areas that people tend to trip up. And for everybody, it's different. Most people, when I look at their life, it's not a complete mess. It's like, everything's going well, but maybe it's the romance part that needs a little support or career's good, romance is good, but they just can't get that exercise routine going. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always one or two areas that people just need a little bit of retooling and, and some help with. That, that makes me think, what do you think of the cl cliche, how you do one thing is how you do everything? That's a good question. I think sometimes people do that because it's sort of like the devil you know. And so maybe once you adopt a strategy, even if it's not working, you just keep doing the same strategy over and over again. It's like banging your head against the wall. And so I think sometimes we do need to learn to be more adaptive, you know, just be flexible and try something new, which I know is scary for the human mind. I talk about that in my book, that newness and novelty sometimes represents a threat to us as human beings, because we're thinking, well, we don't know how to handle this. This is completely new to me. And I wouldn't know how to solve this problem. But if you can get past that hump, you need to have that novelty and that newness to get to the next level. And that's obviously the whole journey of an entrepreneur. Having success in one area, it does bring over the confidence into new areas. It, it's not a guarantee, kind of how you're saying, like some people will be really good at career, but not the best at relationships. Um, however, having some success in something does help. So like, for instance, when I was in my sales job, we always said like, if we can hire athletes, they usually do the best because they already understand hard work pays off and they probably have got some story under their belt where they worked really hard and they won a game and that just like translates over. Um, how much do you think people can um, take some of the wins that they've had in the past and apply it to new things? Um, or where might they run into, where are these struggles coming from where they can be successful in some areas of their life, but not others? Well, I think sometimes it's because their self-confidence is stronger in certain areas than others, and maybe that's based on past experience. And so perhaps they've learned in the past, I'm very, very good in academics, or I'm very, very good at talking to people, but then I'm less good at, you know, going out of the box and doing something athletic, or you just learn these things from past experience and how people respond to you. You know, I always ask people, how do you know that your X or Y personality trait? How do you know that you're funny? How do you know that you know, you're smart? It's because at some point when you were young, somebody gave you that message, whether it's a teacher or other peers, and you're looking around you, you're like, oh, every time I say something, people laugh and I'm a funny guy. 
And I think over time you learn. And so those areas become overdeveloped because you're getting rewards out of those. You know, you get reinforced for being the funny person or being the nice person or being the smart person. And then maybe certain parts of your personality are underdeveloped. That doesn't mean that you don't have skills there. It just means that in some ways you haven't challenged yourself as much in those areas. That doesn't mean that you still can't have success in those areas. And so it's really about overcoming your own limiting beliefs and overcoming that self-doubt and stepping out and just trying. I think that so much of the fear is a fear of failure. It's like fear of making mistakes or fear of being laughed at or fear of not being relevant. And then you just don't do anything. And of course, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and you never get to test out whether or not you had what it takes in the first place not doing anything at all is definitely uh, a sure way to, to to not get any results in it. And you talk about that with uh, the fight or flight response, as well as the freeze response. Uh, elaborate on how is the freeze response different than the flight? Yeah. So whenever we encounter a fear, whether that fear is a fear to our physical body or even a fear to our psychological selves, we tend to have this fight or flight scenario that everybody knows. Either you kind of stay in it and you work through it and you cope or you run away, you avoid. And so one really common avoiding coping strategy would be like playing video games for 10 hours when you know you have a project to do or drinking a little bit too much or oversleeping instead of getting to your to-do list. But people don't realize that there's this third response, which is freeze, which basically means that you end up doing nothing. You just end up staying still. And that is also a strategy that can hold you back because then you just don't challenge yourself. You basically just stay where you are. And then you try to tell yourself a story that it's okay. I'm content with this. I'm okay. I, I don't need a relationship. I don't, I don't really need that anyway. I'm just a loner or I don't really need a better job. This is a great job. And it gives me time on the weekends to do the things that I want. But there's still a part of you that knows that that's not fully true, that maybe there's a part of you that's not fulfilled, not satisfied, but the fight, flight, or freeze response is keeping you still because you're afraid to take a step forward because you're not sure what it will mean. So I think that no matter who you are, when you hear material about how to stop self-sabotage, how to just be a better person, personal growth, there's certain people out there like you and I, we love it. We're like, oh, what's wrong with me? I want to fix it, right? Like we're like, got to be the best that we can. And the average person isn't like that, um, which it's totally cool. But, you know, at the root of that, where they're hearing like, I don't, I don't want to go to Tony Robbins seminar. I don't want some guy to tell me what's wrong with my life. And they're just at this outer phase of not really wanting to embrace like the personal growth route. They probably just don't have, there's fear involved, but there's maybe just a lack of motivation at the core of it. Where do you get your motivation from? What is the main reason why you're always wanting to improve yourself? Well, I think the biggest motivator that will stick around no matter what challenges you find yourself in is really tapping into your values. You know, as a society, we're so obsessed with goals and we're obsessed with bucket lists and checking things off. And of course, goals are important, but goals that are not tethered to values really in the end mean nothing and you can't be motivated by them, especially when things get difficult. So values are different. You can't check them off because values are things that you want your life to stand for. And it's how you want to be remembered. It's sort of like a direction that you want to head in life. So values are things like integrity, honesty, a sense of adventure, spirituality, community, uh, a knowledge and et cetera, et cetera. And so obviously you don't get to a point where you're like, Oh, I've had enough integrity. I can check that off now. No, like you want to live a life with integrity and every day you make progress towards being that person that lives that value out. And so I think that that's really what drives my motivation, especially when things get really tough. I have to just remind myself, but why am I doing it? Like, what's my why? And what is my value that this is fulfilling? And if it's not fulfilling a value, then I have to question, why did I even commit to this goal in the first place? Maybe I need to rework the goal, right? So I really think that you shouldn't even set a goal until you think about, does this actually fulfill one of the values that's important to me? And to your point, Derek, most people don't like true self-development because if you're really doing that right, 
it's not a picnic. Like all of this like positive psychology stuff, sometimes I feel like it goes overboard and it gets into that toxic positivity. Like things aren't amazing all the time. And if you want to be your best self, it's not just going to be like this upward trajectory. There's going to be times where you feel really bad. Like, oh man, I just found out why I do this and I don't like myself right now. Right. But mm -hmm. like, and over the hump and then you're like yay now i've conquered it so there's gonna be the ebbs and flows and without really good values and really focusing on those you're not gonna make it through the troughs you know the, the downs of those uh, moments where you're trying to get better so it does have to start with some self-reflection of why are you even wanting to get better and i i think for anyone that's in an entrepreneur space where they're uh they're going out on their own and they're income is truly just based on their skill set. It's not that hard to adapt personal growth as like part of your routine. If you're in a position, if you're making the same, whether you read personal growth books or not, it can be a little bit harder. You know, you can chase a promotion and things like that, but it doesn't really have, um, you know, maybe the value tied to it where it's like, well, now the value is only for my own self knowing that I'm more skilled, but it's not going to like translate to much. So um, how might someone, it seems like, based off of the opportunities we put ourselves in in the first place, then leads us to want, wanting to embrace growth and things like that. What are some things that you've maybe done where you just signed up for it and you just put yourself out there uh, or some tips that you could have for someone for that they, they want to take some kind of leap in their life. Um, but as far as like starting with Tony Robbins, as far as starting with like those you know, the, the toxic uh, positivity, as you kind of said, they're not really at like the, the frou-frou stuff yet. Where, where's like your favorite starting point for people? I think for me, my favorite starting point is like, just do one bold thing every day. Don't overthink it and just do one bold thing. And that one bold thing doesn't always have to even be in your career because we're talking about instilling this as a habit or a practice. And so the one bold thing could just be like, signing up for a class that you were interested in taking, but you haven't, you know, actually taken the leap or calling somebody you haven't spoken to for a long time, because that's always awkward. But then if you're like, Hey, I miss this person. I want to check in on them. That could be your bold thing. You know, it could be anything from trying a new recipe or doing something completely new in your exercise routine, but just get in the habit of starting to challenge yourself with one new thing a day and, and not overthinking it. I think what ends up holding people back is like, they're very analytical and they're very thoughtful. And those are obviously good qualities, but like, again, everything in moderation, when that is taken to the extreme, all of that analytical thinking just gets you stuck. And then you are thinking about all the horrible things that could happen. And then you just never, ever move forward. I mean, the last thing that I would want people to do when I think about how we want to reflect back on our lives when we get older is like, I don't want anyone to have any regrets. I want you to look back at your life and be like, I gave it my all. And yeah, I made some mistakes, but I never will ever ask myself, what if, right? Like that's a horrible feeling to have to say, what if I did this? Like maybe my life would be different or maybe I'd have some different memories or, you know. So I think that that's really the goal. The goal is just to start challenging yourself to not overthink. And if you have an idea and an inspiration, just try it. Just, just do it. Do one new thing a day. And then that becomes your new normal. So then when the really big project comes up that you value and it's important to you, you'll get stuck a lot less. You're already used to embracing the uncomfortable. Yeah. I think yeah. I kind of like it. You know, I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, I think. So I kind of enjoy challenges. You did a uh, trapeze or it, what do you, what do you call it? Yeah, the flying trapeze. Yes. Uh, okay. That, um, <laughs> but how did that go? Well, it was great because I actually have a little bit of a fear of heights and at the same time, I just admire the circus performers. I'm like, how do they just do these things? Like they just, sometimes they don't even have nets. Like it's just crazy to me. And so I just, again, it was just one of those things. I just did it on a whim. That was my thing of the day. There was a trapeze school that opened near where I lived and I was driving by it. And I said, you know, what? I'm just going to go. <laughs> and you didn't Google how many people die from trapeze a year <laughs> first. Exactly. You don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know and i've had some close calls where i definitely could have gotten seriously injured but like you don't think about that when you go you know that's not the point i mean you want to be you want to be careful but you also don't want to overthink things uh-huh 
everything's such a happy medium out there you know it's like be risky and risk averse and uh, never give up but pivot if your ideas aren't working you know like there's so much like yeah. you just have to understand uh, through experience really to know where that happy medium is for you it's like experience it's a little bit of intuition which isn't just you know uh, some frou-frou idea. Intuition actually is scientific. It is something that comes from your brain, but it comes from like the lower, more uh, pr uh, medieval parts of your brain. So it doesn't really speak in languages like the way that our frontal lobe does. It's more just like, it's a feeling, but the feeling comes from experience and common sense. And so that's why intuition actually is good to lean on when you can hone that. And also in my book, I talk about, just as you were saying, it's the balance. It's a balance of like avoiding threat and attaining rewards. Like you have to keep those things in balance. And so a little bit of risk taking, a little bit of risk adverse, like a little bit of, I want to be motivated by these rewards, a little bit of, but not too much, you know? So it really is finding that equilibrium for yourself, but always trying to move forward in the process. Okay. Yeah. There, there's really no other way to say it when you want to do stuff. You just got to find your way to do it. And everyone's got to, you got to find like what motivates you. Cause I think everyone's got, as you were alluding to, like, I don't want to die with regrets. And that's always been like a thing for me. Like if I had to sum up, like, how am I living my life? And it's like, really, I'm just doing it to avoid as many regrets as possible. Um, even if that is paved with like way more failures, I've just kind of like had that philosophy. Um, is, is that your main life philosophy? Or is there something else that you constantly find yourself going back to where you're like, this is really like the summary of why how I live I, it comes back down to this yeah I think one of my main things that I always think about is just how short our life is <laughs> and it's like a blip of time uh -huh. also, we don't know when it's gonna end I mean that's kind of the beauty and the tragedy of a human life you know and it, it could end tomorrow you know it could end 80 years from now you just don't know and so you kind of have to live every day as if it was your last. And as cliche as that sounds, don't wait until tomorrow what you can do today because you may or may not have that tomorrow. You know, I've had, for example, loved ones die suddenly or, you know, people move away suddenly. And then it's like all these plans that you had where you were going to go and do all these things. Now you can't do them. And so I think it's important just to really think about how you want to spend each of your days. And it doesn't mean that every day needs to be crazy productive. I mean, some of what is valuable in life is the relaxation, is the enjoyment, is hanging out with it's friends. It's why they're being productive in the first place with the goal of that relaxation. Yeah. I mean, you have to just do the things again, going back to the things that you value. So, you know, you value the productivity, you value learning, but you also value your community, your family, like people that you care about, you know, doing things that you enjoy in psychology. There's a concept that we call flow and flow is when you're doing something where it's challenging. Um, but it's also so intrinsically interesting to you that you almost lose track of time. It's like time becomes like completely dilated and you have no idea. Whoa, how did I just how did four hours just go by? And, you know, I can't believe that. It's so great if you can find something in every single day where you feel like that about, you know, where you're like, whoa, like, I can't believe that all this time has passed because I've been so into this, whatever I'm doing. And that could be a thing related to your work, or it could just be something related to you hanging out with people you really care about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So shifting gears here, I think uh, I got some unique questions that these are probably more for myself that I need to know how the heck you did these things but I, i'm sure some people out there anyone who's trying to be a personal brand being on tv writing a book is like the high end of being a personal brand right rather than oh I'm, i kill it with my infographics and we will talk about your infographics and your reels in a bit here too um but you were co-host on the tv show the doctors i know you weren't just like on craigslist looking for a job and it said oh i'll apply for this how the heck did this happen? Tell me about the path and getting there and what was some of the things that, like, how did they even find you? Yeah, so I've uh, been in performing arts since I was a kid. So it's always been a hobby. I've been in musicals, I've been in plays. And then when I was in grad school, I was in a few TV shows just for fun. You know, they were just sort of like things I was doing on the side while I was in school. And so I was acting on the side as a hobby. And then when I became a psychologist, um, a couple of people who had seen me in these like t tiny roles on little TV shows were like, hey, we saw that you're a psychologist. Like, would you be willing to try? And 
and uh, be a psychologist for this TV show and talk about that part of your expertise. I was like, sure. So it's not acting now. It's just about my expertise. And so I've been, my, my journey has been kind of unique in that I've been able to kind of marry these two passions where I already had the performing arts background. And that's kind of how the first TV producer found me. But Derek, just like anything else, a lot of it is like word of mouth when you keep doing a good job. So every industry is much smaller than we think it is, right? You like, you start finding the same influencers, you keep seeing all of their posts. It's the same thing on TV and all the producers start watching each other's shows. And they're like, oh, I saw that you were on CNN. Well, we want you to be on NBC news today. And so they just find you, but it's all about making sure that every single time you show up, you're absolutely prepared and you're not taking it for granted. Cause something that I always think about is there's like a thousand other therapists who would like my job right now. And so, you know, you always have to show up and like give it, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. You just have to show up and always give it 110%. And basically you can never take it for granted. And so really it's about doing a good job, being kind, showing people the breadth of what you can do. And also when people interview you for new TV opportunities, being able to talk yourself up in a way that's confident, but doesn't sound egotistical. Like you have to be able to market yourself. You have to be able to say, I can absolutely deliver for you. If you're looking for somebody to talk about parenting, here's my experience in parenting. I've worked with these types of patients. This is the techniques I teach them. And you really have to make a play at every single opportunity that comes your way. And I think that I've done the best that I can, which is how I eventually arrived on The Doctors. So what happened was they asked me to be on one guest segment on The Doctors. And again, I like studied like crazy, made sure I really knew the topic. And then after that, they called me and they said, hey, we're gonna try out some people to be recurring guest co-hosts. Would you like to do that with us? And I said, sounds great. And they said, okay, we'll just start with like taping one episode a week. I'm like, okay. And before you knew it, I was taping four episodes a week. And then after that, they offered me a co-host contract. And so it's really just about delivering every time with any opportunities that you're given once you make your way into the industry. And that first opportunity was in college making videos for like, was it for public consumption at, at all? No. So when I was in college, I was, again, I was performing already, but it wasn't necessarily in the field of psychology. I was just performing. I was like singing and I was like being in musicals and, you know, doing like hobbyist acting on the side. But after that, um, you know, when I became a psychologist and the first producer found me, you know, obviously I try to do everything that I could to keep getting my name out there. So back then, um, I think my very first social media that I started was probably Facebook. So then like, whenever I got like the video, I would like post it on Facebook. I would put it on LinkedIn. Um, I started a YouTube channel and I would put my, uh, my clips on there so that it would be easier for people to find me. And, you know, and I think that those are the types of things that you have to try to do for yourself. I mean, you never know if it's going to pay off, but sometimes it does. And I've had producers tell me, oh, I saw your YouTube video talking about adult ADHD. I thought it was really interesting. And now we want to have you on our show to talk about it. And so you never know when something's going to generate a lead and you just have to put it out there. And, and like you said, you know, let the public see it. And sometimes opportunities will come your way because you've been doing that. Even if the video doesn't get a ton of views when you publish it, when someone's like, I need to research uh, this Dr. Judy lady here because i saw her on this tv show let me see what else she does okay she's got a youtube channel like one of the views of your 78 views could be like that producer or something um big like that so you just you created all of this awareness or you just started mass producing content in a lot of ways and you've got your podcast now you know the the fact that you have a book is just getting your name out there as much as you can so it has it sounds like a long road before you actually got to the the bigger leagues like that but it really was nothing like secret or anything you weren't like oh yeah i my dad is the doctor's <laughs> uh producer you know anything like that you kind of just kept putting yourself out there yeah, I had no connections in the industry. And when I started, I mean, I could never imagine that, that this would be where my TV career would grow to. But like you said, Derek, there really isn't a secret except for continuing to work hard and just exploring these new avenues. And as you mentioned, you never know when one video is going to take off. So like, yeah, a lot of my YouTube uh, channel videos, some of them are like 180 views. But then, you know, certain topics like, after a few weeks of posting, I'll go back and I'm like, what? 300,000 views, you know? So you just don't know which one is going to speak to people and 
what, how people are going to find you. So you mm-hmm. have to just keep putting it out there. Like, don't give up. I, I've seen some people who say, well, I don't know how so-and-so has become so, like, so internet famous overnight. Of course you always hear those stories, but in general, before that person became internet famous, they had produced things for 10 years and nobody was listening <laughs> and they just kept going. Yeah. So yeah. you do have to enjoy what you're doing yeah. to, to, to be able to keep going. Exactly. And I think that that's why you can't just do it for the likes. I mean, obviously you're doing it for business opportunities, but you also have to remember some of my business opportunities came from a video that only had 50 views, but it was just on topic to what the producer was wanting to talk about. And when they typed in YouTube, trying to find someone who could talk about it, they just typed it in the way that you put your title that time. Exactly. And I think that, you know, again, I'm not an expert in this, but I do know how important it is, for example, to use keywords so that people can search for things that might come up. And so I use this tool called Keywords Everywhere. And I think it's a Chrome extension where you can kind of see Mm -hmm. how people are searching for a certain word and you just try to tag them to your YouTube videos so that people will watch and find. And I have found that that's helpful. You know, when I actually take the time to do that, even though I'm totally a keywords newbie, even that tiny little effort it does tend to pay off more. Like people will find that video more and there will be more watches on those videos. Yeah, the keywords everywhere tool is, is a good one. It, it's free and then there's a paid version. I'm not sure what the difference is, but I've got that one as well. Yeah, it's super cheap. I mean, I, I think you buy credit basically. So that Okay, you, and then you do it per search? Yeah, and then it's like a dollar per search. I mean, it's okay. really affordable. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about the, the creation of the book. Uh, again, I think a lot of people, I think probably most people under 30, if you ask them, are you ever going to write a book? I think a lot of people would say yes, or like a high percentage. Like my answer is like, probably, but I still don't like I've got a list of book ideas on my phone is where I'm at right now. Is that how it started for you? Did you have like this book on your notes folder of like, I'm going to write a book called stop, stop self, self sabotage for years. Did you get the idea and act on it right away? And uh, tell, tell us about the journey of creating it, how long it took, and then getting it published. Yeah. So I always, like you, always thought of wanting to write a book, but it was that kind of vague idea in the back of your mind. You're like, I'm going to get to it someday, sometime. Um, talking about self-sabotage has been something that I've wanted to do for many years because I saw it so much with my patients, with my family members, with my friends, with my colleagues. I'm like, this is a universal topic and no one's written the definitive book on it yet. And I want to write that book. But again, it was just like these ideas that were percolating in my head. But one day when I was co-hosting the doctors, I met this author and her name is Emma Johnson. So like shout out to Emma because she really is the one who started me on this journey of publishing the book. But her and I just totally hit it off. And she said, have, have you thought about writing a book? Cause she was there basically to talk about her book on the show. And she's, uh, she was like, have you ever thought about writing a book? I'm like, definitely. And she's like, well, if you have an idea, I can connect you with my agent. And I think this is a part of something that I always think about is like, whenever you are handed an opportunity, like make the most of it. So at that moment, I was like, I have ideas and an outline of my book jotted down. But the minute she was like, I can introduce you to my publisher and I can introduce you to my agent. Then I just over a course of a week really like hunkered down and like put together actual proposal so that I could make the most out of the opportunity. And that's really eventually how I got my book published. It's meeting somebody who actually had the connections, but then not just saying, okay, great. Thanks for the connection. And then just waiting for the call. Like, then you make it happen. Like you just go full force. And I'm like, this is like now or never, you know, if she's going to introduce me to her agent, I have to impress this agent so that she'll take me on as a client. So I spent a whole week, like retooling the outline, really developing it, pitching this book to the agent. And then the agent said, you know what? I really do like that idea. Let's, let's make it work. So they bid on the first idea too. Yeah. So I just told her that idea. I just said, this is my main idea. And this is the one that I want to do. And I explained why I wanted to do it. But at that point, I already had like a 10 page proposal that I had written down as soon as Emma said, I'm going to introduce you to my agent. You know, I really worked hard on that. And I think that that's, that's, that's a big lesson. I think it's just whenever you are given those opportunities, um, you got to make the most of them. Don't wait. You know, like you just have that one chance, like, don't say no, just, just go for it. How much did the doctors allow you to talk about your book on the show? A lot. They have been so nice. Yeah, they were so amazing. Um, I think we did maybe between two or three segments all on the book. 
um, we did giveaways for the book for the audience. Um, I got to work with a guest, you know, who came and she had some issues with losing weight and like starting a healthy routine. So it was super fun. And I think that it is important that you keep working to get your own, um, contacts when you have a book, cause you have to market it for yourself. Obviously the publisher helps, but ultimately it's always on you. You're the one who needs to come up with those ideas, pitch them to your publisher, see if they like it and they'll support it because the best marketer for you is you. So even if you hire a publicist and there's supposed to be somebody who's like getting you out there, if you don't stay on your publicist and you give them new ideas, everybody gets complacent without a little pressure. You know, we mm -hmm. all have intrinsic motivation, right? And, and you're probably always inventing new ways to like essentially sell your book in your head or like, oh, that's a key point. I need to bring up that more. And I get that all the time too. And I've done some delegating of like even paid ads and stuff. And I'm like not doing that anymore because it was just like they, unless I was giving them new ideas all the time, they weren't coming up with them because it wasn't their baby. It wasn't their their product that they're always thinking about, you know, and coming up with these ideas and you have to, all right, now I need to test that idea like right away. Um, so yeah, everyone, I like to say that whether you're an artist, an author, a musician, a realtor, that one's more obvious, but pretty much every single industry, you are in sales. And if you don't realize that you can't just write a book and also not be in sales, then you're going to have a book, but not sell any copies. Yeah. And you know, what's so crazy, Derek, is like, I've heard your stories on the podcast about you being great at sales. In my mind, I've always feared sales. When I was a kid and we had those fundraisers where you had to sell like wrapping paper or cookies, I would literally just make my parents buy the minimum and just to like get it done, you know, cause I was always afraid of sales. And in my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to be a psychologist. I don't need to be in sales. Are you kidding? Even in private practice, that's sales. Like, mm -hmm. how are you going to convince your patients that you are the psychologist who's going to help them? They're obviously interviewing other psychologists too. I mean, it's all about sales too. You have to be able to say, I'm the person who's going to help you. So no matter what you do in life, I think it is sales. Like, so anybody who's saying, I'm, I'm not as good at sales or I want to avoid sales. You can't, if you're any kind of entrepreneur, you have to basically get over that fear and know that you have to market yourself, obviously in a genuine way, but like, mm -hmm. it's always going to be about sales at the end of the day. So how did you stop self-sabotage your, yourself for uh, thinking, I'm not a salesman or just talk me through an example, essentially of how maybe, I don't know if you can go through all six steps, but how would you eliminate that fear? Yeah. You know, so much of it starts with your thought process because thoughts are the genesis of everything. You know, something happens to you, you have an interpretation about it. And that interpretation could lead you to have certain feelings that might be negative or holding you back. And then that can lead to certain actions that cause you to stay still or avoid the things that you say you really want to do. And I think, you know, taking that example of myself of like thinking, well, I'm a, I'm a really good psychologist. I shouldn't have to sell myself, but then realizing that everybody else is marketing themselves and you, you kind of have to play the game. You know, it was hard, you know, because at first I was thinking, well, that just feels yucky. I don't want to have to sell myself. Had you had an experience as a child where the sales salesman was very high pressure? You know, I, gosh, I, I don't remember some of the specific experiences. Although I do remember one time I had to, when I was in college, one of my first jobs was as a telemarketer and that experience scared the shit out of me. Honestly, I, because people yell at you, you know, as a telemarketer, I mean, people hate you, you know? So I think that really soured my mind mm -hmm. to like sales, but then I would always admire people who were great at sales and would be very natural about it. Like they wouldn't be super pushy, but they're just good, you know, like, and they don't give up. Right. They like, they're like, okay, well, even if you don't want to talk about it now, like I'll give you a call in a day and we'll just, we'll see if you want to talk about then. Like there's always some way to keep in touch. And, um, I always thought that that was a really great skill. So I think when I became a psychologist and I had my own private practice, I had to really change my mind to say, you know, if you don't speak assertively about your services, how do people know you exist? How do people know that you're doing great work? They don't. Right. And then, then when I published my book, I went through that same cycle of like, oh, I don't want to be that person who's always selling my book. I don't want to be that person who always like, well, in my book, stop self-sabotage. Like, I just didn't want to be that person. But I talked to somebody and he really helped me because he said, you know, but you have to think about the fact that like, you have something great to offer. 
And so it's not so much like selling something that people don't want, but it's like, you have to think of yourself as like, he was really funny. He's like, you have to think of yourself as a delicious flavor of ice cream. And you're like giving people delicious ice cream. Like think about how you would sell ice cream. Think about something that, that would bring value to people that people like, like, don't think about it as, Oh, like people don't want to hear from me because that was like a self-defeating type of idea when it comes to marketing a book. So when you write it, it's a great experience. I love writing it, but if you don't deliver the rest of the way and invest in the marketing, then the book is not going to go anywhere. I think it's a really good example to use of how people view sales as a potential belief that they've had in the past, like a limiting belief that, uh, maybe they had an experience with the salesman. Like I remember when I go into home sometimes, like even their kids would be like, there's a salesman here. I'm like, I can easily tell that you adapted your parents' mindset on salesmen because like they'll try to, I'll knock on the door for my scheduled appointment. And then the other, uh, the, their spouse didn't know about the appointment and they'll be like, we're not interested. Close the door. I'm like, I, I have an appointment. And they're like, wait, you have an appointment. And then the, now they got to be nice to me, but it's like, they're, they just think I'm going to sell them whatever the last guy was selling. And if that guy wasn't trained, they are going to project that on me. And most salesmen aren't like, it takes years to be like really good at the customer, not even knowing that they're being sold. Like everyone loves to be sold stuff. And like you're saying, like you like the, per the salesman who's persistent, but you have to be pleasantly persistent. And there's a lot of little ways that you can word something that just makes it all of a sudden he's trying to convince me versus that is a good idea. And it like really, it's really hard to nail that verbiage. Um, but I think it's something that a lot of people have some kind of preconceived notion on. So that would be something to work through all of you listening here who are entrepreneurs trying to get more sales. Why is it that you have a problem closing your customers? is something that you can work through this process, the six steps that Judy lays out and find out, okay, it was, it was that, um, you know, that solar salesman probably when I was 17 at the yeah. trade show. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times I think our limiting beliefs, like you said, come from childhood or come from maybe a self doubt about ourselves, or maybe sometimes it just comes from a fear of the unknown or like what's to come. And so I think really my book talks you through how you deal with those limiting beliefs, depending on where they're, uh, where they're coming from. And then it's really important from there to be able to then change those thought processes. And it's really about having more balanced thinking. You know, I think a lot of people, they don't realize it, but their thoughts are limiting because they're catastrophic or very black and white. Like like it's either going to be a huge success or a huge failure. You know, um, there's all of these different things that they tell themselves. And I think the really big first step is to like examine those thoughts, being able to change them. And then after that, really looking at your behavior patterns and seeing where your behavior patterns need a little bit of help. Oftentimes we're just kind of walking around life, not being mindful of exactly what we're doing. And then we're doing these bad behaviors over and over again, they're not getting results. So eventually you have to analyze that. And again, really tap into your values, what's important to you so that when the going gets tough, you still have that motivation and willpower to carry you through. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, uh, wrapping up here, we're going to shift gears one more time. And I want to go into talking about, I, I don't know exactly uh, what I'd be getting at here, I think I'm just genuinely interested. And there's only so many people I can ask this question to, because you mentor adults, you mentor, uh, you know, a lot of youth as well, because you work at a university, you've seen so many different experiences, so many different types of people, they all learn differently. Um, but it's no question that every generation it has some major differences compared to the generation before it, you know, even like, um, you know, I'm at the edge of the millennials and, uh, the Gen Z has a lot of differences and, and a lot of it is even just like social media, honestly, like how prominent social media was during the time you were in school or now there's like swipe apps for dating is so common. It's completely changes the entire dating landscape, things like that. What's something that you can say positive about the upcoming generation that you think they're doing better? And then go ahead and say 10 things that you hate about them. <laughs> well, I think the positive thing is that a lot of them are actually much more interested in this idea of self-development, like this, this idea of wanting to improve and wanting to get better and, and actually getting a bit better about talking about their feelings. I feel like 
um, there's, you know, the generations that are ahead of me than who are older than me. A lot of it is just like, let's just hunker down and do what's needed. I don't want to talk about the fact that I'm feeling depressed or anxious. And obviously it's good to be able to acknowledge that so you can actually work through those feelings. So I think that's one thing that they're doing great at. Um, I think it's great that they seem to be so passionate and like want to do different things with their lives that are out of the box. Those are all amazing things. But some of the challenges that I have with this younger generation is that they oftentimes will basically just, I think they look at what's going on in social media and they think, well, I can be like that. I should be able to do that. And you probably could, but you have to put in the work. And sometimes you don't see the backstage of what somebody is doing. I mean, you see all their success. You see that they have a million followers and you think, okay, well, how come I'm not doing that? How come? Well, it's because you haven't put in the effort. And there's really no shortcut. Even those people who have that instant overnight success, how do you keep people following you? How do you keep people subscribing to your YouTube channel? You have to keep coming up with amazing content. If you're just mm -hmm. a one-off, I mean, have, haven't you seen it's that? It's not really like I made it. No. It's like I'm making it. It's always a process. And I, I'm sure you've seen those YouTube channels where there's been like one amazing video that took off and then the rest of their videos, nothing. And it's because they haven't been able to generate something that was worthy of people continuing to follow them at the same pace. And then, then there are the people who like, they make the most of that opportunity. Oh my God, they woke up overnight. Oh my gosh, this video got 10,000 views overnight. And then they're just already thinking like, what's the next video? Like, how am I going to keep this going? And I think that that's the difference. You know, it's really about perseverance. There's really no shortcuts. I mean, life is just, it's going to be hard work. But if you are continuing to reinvent yourself, willing to challenge yourself and not afraid of failure, you're going to keep moving forward. I mean, for the longest time, I really didn't like social media. I was like, uh, what's a psychologist doing on social media? Again, this is like when I was raised and when I was going through school, nobody really had social media. And then I realized, oh, but it's so important. Even when I was publishing my book, my publisher asked me, well, how many followers do you have on social media? And that really affected how much money I was getting on my book deal, right? So it's a, it's a currency and you have to start buying in and be adaptable. And I think, you know, listening to your podcast, I've been able to learn a lot of lessons about, okay, here are the things that you can do to like, try to get your social media out to more people. Here's what you can do to add value. You know, here's what you should do to engage followers in a po in an appropriate way. And then whenever Instagram releases a new feature, even if I don't really know how to use it, I just use it because you realize that it works. I mean, again, nobody knows the secrets of the Instagram algorithm for real, but you know that whenever they release uh, a new I, No, I do, remember? Just just me. You do, only you. Yeah, just me. Only you, everybody. <laughs> okay. but, um, but no, I mean, like, even if you don't know the details, you do know that whenever they release a new feature, they dump a ton of attention to it. And I've seen it. Like, I'll put up, I, I was one of the first people to use the reel when I figured out that it came out. And some of those first videos, I don't think that they were great, but you know, they would get like 40,000 views, like just crazy stuff like that because they were probably dumping more attention into the explore pages and everything else when you were being an early adopter of their platform uh, features. Let's piggyback off on that to just talk about your Instagram strategies. Um, so whether it be things like hashtagging or like the little technical stuff, or it's just the personality that you've found that people identify with the most on Instagram, like what types of posts identify um, with people. We'll start with the reels. Um, yeah. So that's been, I like your reels a lot. I think they're definitely like a way that it's kind of like, all right, what is a psychologist doing on social media? And you're like, well, here's like the normal message that I would want to convey. And now I'm going to turn it into a dance with some music. So guys, go check them out at Dr. Judy Ho to see what we're talking about. Um, but what's been working well with you for reels and what are you going to do from here? Well, I think for me, I think about how can I still put out that message of like providing value, giving people tips for motivation, productivity, and mental and physical wellness, but in a way that can be truncated into a 15 second video with music. And I think it's just a different way to deliver the message, but the message is always like, here are your tips for the day, or here are the things that you can do for your morning routine, or here are some positive messages to tell yourself when you're having a bad day, except you're doing them to music and to rhythm. And it can be really fun. So I actually have a lot of fun making my reels, but it does take time. I'm not great at them in terms of efficiency. So sometimes I'll be like, I've been editing this 15 second video for 30 minutes. Like, so it can really definitely eat up time, but I really- Or choosing the song for an hour. 
Yeah. Oh, I know. Sometimes oh, I, I really, I'm like, it has to be the perfect song. And then, uh-huh. then I'm a little OCD. I'm like, wait, but like the message has to come up on the beat. And so then I just keep shifting things around. So, you know, it can really eat up your time, but I actually have fun doing it. And I have fun watching like the reactions to it. But I think really for me, really figuring out how you add value. And part of the, what I do on Instagram is I do a lot of research of other accounts that are doing well. You know, I, I look at other accounts who are in the wellness space and I look at the types of things that they post and I think, oh, wow, whenever people talk about mindset, they get a lot of comments, they get a lot of likes. I'm going to make something about mindset tomorrow and see how that tracks, right? And obviously the tips are mine, but I do look for themes that are popular on social media. I look in the Explorer, I look in under hashtags and I see what people are responding to. And that's been a really big part of knowing kind of what to do on social media next when you don't feel inspired. Hashtags are a hundred percent important. You know, some, I, I remember I talked to a social media manager once and she was like, oh, I don't like hashtags. They don't look good. Like aesthetically. I'm like, if I didn't use hashtags, I doubt my social media would have grown as much as it did. I, I mean, sometimes you look and it says that, you know, 20% of your views came from hashtags and like 30% of people weren't following you. So how were they finding this post? They were finding it through the hashtags. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of the tips that you talked about. Like I, I split my attention between really big hashtags that have, you know, lots and lots of tags and then ones that are a bit more niche. And I test them out. I test out different hashtag groups, but I always use between 25 to 30. I really maximize the hashtags because, you know, they're there for a reason. You got to use them, you know? So, um, and you I put def- them in the comments. I, I sometimes put them in the comments and I sometimes put them in the actual, uh, post. And so I have not found that it was a problem. I just put like five little dots so that there's a separation and mm-hmm. nobody, nobody ever comments on them. No one's like, I hate your hashtags. Like I've literally never gotten that comment. Nobody cares. So people I think people are good at tuning them out now. Yeah. I, I feel like so- so too. And then I think it's also really important that if you are going to put a post up, make sure that it's thoughtful. Like I am very consistent on social media. I post six to seven times and I do stories at least four to five days of the week. But if I really feel like I don't have time to put up a good post, I just skip that day because I think sometimes people think, Oh my God, I have to post one day, one time a day. But if it's going to be crappy content, you might as well not and just skip that day. Or if you're just feeling that uninspired, it is okay to skip a day sometimes. And I've done that before. So um, I think as long as you're generally consistent and you're really thinking about quality and what value you're offering to people, I mean, unless you're Beyonce, nobody really cares that you're like out shopping, right? So for me, all of my posts are like value. It's like, I'm making a recipe that's healthy. Here's the recipe or here's my tip on how to overcome self-defeating thinking. You know, here is a reel that tells you how to have a good morning routine. Um, Here are my top five tips on how to better communicate, but it's always around the theme and it's always really well thought out. And I really use the captions. I never just post something and say, caption this. Like, no, I post something and I add the value in the captions. And the great thing is I can actually then utilize that and move it over to my blog. So I think sometimes when people feel overwhelmed, like there's too much to do, you can obviously do cross promotion. And one of the things that I do is I use the captions that I write and I move them over to my blog on my website. And then that's a whole other audience that gets to see those tips and those pictures. Absolutely. You got to use Instagram as a traffic source to fuel everything else because you can't just have a a whole business take place on there it sounds like that and i think this is a major thing that people do wrong when they're trying to grow a personal brand is that they might mimic well what's beyonce doing okay show them everything i'm doing got it you know like they only care because it's her but you've kind of said all right they're, they're not following me for like, I just want to know what she's doing all the time. You know, they're, they're following you for the value and the content you're providing and, and keeping it focused on that has been a key to your success. It seems like rather than, you know, once I think people, once they start getting followers too, they're like, wow, like people love me and they do, but they, they love the way that you bring your value, not just like you and your life itself. So don't, get too distracted from your main point. Yeah, exactly. And I think some of the things that people sometimes get obsessed about is, oh my gosh, you know, this post only got this many likes. Whenever I post a picture of myself, 
um, I do get more likes on those. And if I was to post an infographic that like either my picture is smaller or it's not even on there. Um, but what really is important to track, and I know that you've talked about this in previous episodes, is more like how many people are saving, how many people are sharing. And so the interesting thing is, yes, if I post a picture of myself, I do get more likes. But if I post something that's really valuable, sometimes I get less likes compared to a picture of myself, but I get like three times more saves and shares. And then I know that this is a valuable piece of content. And you can also tell by the quality of people who are commenting, right? So if, if people are just commenting like, you're cute, like that's not valuable to me. But if people are commenting, I really needed this today. I read this and it made me feel better. Thank you. Like that's when I know that I'm hitting the right spot for me as a personal brand, being somebody who is a psychologist, who is selling wellness and motivation and productivity. You comment back and say, thanks, buy my book. Yeah, I know. It's like, everybody, please go buy the book. Go to <laughs> Linktree. Um, yeah, and then I started using Linktree too. That's another new thing. I, for the longest time, I fought Linktree because I was thinking nobody wants to go to a Linktree. But I, I actually find that if your Linktree is not overwhelming, because sometimes I have opened people's Linktrees and they'll be like 25 different things. And it's like, you just, oh, it's too much. You just click away. My link tree always only has four to five things and I rotate which ones are on top. And so every week it's fresh to whatever I'm promoting that week, whether it's my new podcast episode or something special about the book or like a new promotion I'm running or something like that. That's good to bring up because I'm not always the biggest fan of link tree because most people do do it where it's, um, you know, way too much words and uh, the, just everything you could ever want from me is right here. Um, I was on yours earlier today. I think there's like five on there. Yours looks really nice. Do you have the pro version? Is that how you were able to? I invested. It's like $7 a month. Uh -huh. and you can really actually make it look much more like you. You know, you can yeah. pictures and you can insert photos. It's so much better than the generic link tree. So I gave it a shot only because for a while I was switching up the link every week. Like it would be different things every week. And that was another strategy, but I actually found that the link tree when it's not overwhelming and you just have four or five things that you want to uh, promote, it works pretty well. And I get a lot of click throughs. And I think it's just that feeling of being overwhelmed. I've definitely been on people's link trees where they have 25 things. Like you said, it's like, here's my whole life. And you immediately click away. It's like, having more choice is actually in psychology, a bad thing. Like you don't want to have that much choice. Like we've all been to those restaurants where usually it's like those deli restaurants that have like 20 pages of menu items and you just can't even think it's like, uh -huh. I'll get to number 37. Yeah, it's too much. It's too yeah. much. In some ways you almost do better with like a one page menu. And that's yeah. what we find in psychology is like limit people's choices and just direct them to what you really want them to see, they'll find the rest. Once they get interested in you, they'll do the rest of the research. They'll click around your website. They'll find your other podcast episodes, but just promote, I think a few things at a time and then keep them interesting and keep them fresh. I also change my um, bio description a lot, like just to test out, you know, really what am I offering to people and what should I be talking about this week? And then I see if I get more followers. Like I just constantly am testing stuff out on Instagram. I think now that I have a decent amount of followers, I know that I'm doing something right. And I've been less afraid to venture out because for a while when I was growing, I was thinking, oh my God, I found the way to grow. Don't change anything. And then you realize, no, but then you get stale. You have to keep following the trends and just trying them out, you know, and some things work out and some things don't. Something that doesn't work for me is um, the, what are they called? IGTVs. Those just don't get quite as much traction as the rest of my content, but I still tried them out, right? So everybody's account is going to be different. And I think that you just have to keep reinventing yourself. You just have to keep trying things to see what works and what doesn't. What would you say are the 20% of effort that you've put in that has grown 80% of your following? Really being thoughtful about what value I'm providing to people and, and really thinking about providing that value in a way that people can get just from the picture. So sometimes I'll have these like long form captions, but the picture itself maybe is like subpar or can't be summed up in the picture. And I realize that those don't grow my account as much. The ones that really grow my account is if you look at the picture, all the tips are on there. Maybe it's like on a whiteboard or it's on an infographic. Piece and of then paper the, you're holding up. Yeah, exactly. And then the caption like elaborates further. 
those are the ones that I get the most follows from, the most shares from, and the most saves. And so I think because Instagram is such a visual medium, you have to remember that. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm just going to post a picture of myself standing on the street. And then the caption is like, here's how you motivate yourself. But then the Mm -hmm. picture and the caption have nothing to do with each other. And when they look at the picture, it's just a picture of a nice person. And they scroll on before they open, they click read more. Yeah, exactly. Uh So I think that that's really been the biggest thing is that the, that 20% is what really pays off. And where'd getting, you learn that? You know, I don't, I mean, I've obviously learned it from you. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but like, I also think that for a long time, I was thinking, does that really work on my account? You know, I think when you hear a tip, you're like, does that apply to my industry? But I would definitely say, Derek, that like, when I listen to your podcast, every episode, I take something from it and I try it. And, and then you find out if it works or not. Like mm-hmm. some of them work really, really well for me. And I think the predominance of your ideas have worked really well for my industry, but you don't know if you don't try. And so yeah. some ideas I'm like, Hmm, this person that Derek interviewed, she's like a fitness person. So I'm not really that person, but I'll still try it. And then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, right? And so I think you just have to experiment. And I've really enjoyed listening to a lot of the interviews that you've had because it's been a variety of different people in different industries. And I've still been able to take something important from every single one of those interviews and be like, let's try it on my brand. And then sometimes it works. I think it's something to say about modeling success. It's that if someone else is seeing success with something, it means it's worth you trying, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. It's, I think a lot of business coaches too get in the mindset like, hey, it worked for this business, it'll work for every business, but there's still, there's going to be some translating that needs to happen to your industry and to your customers and to sound like it's coming from you and not just like, oh yeah, doing something totally off brand that you wouldn't do. Totally. And it's also about translating the advice that some of your guests have given or you've given and thinking, okay, I could probably make that work for me, but it probably just needs to be retooled a little bit so that it fits my brand better. Right. But, but even some of the simplest things that don't, that seem simple, but when you implement them, it works so well. Like I remember you had interviewed somebody who I think, I mean, he had like a million, it's, this is like John. John what is yeah. 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 John. Yeah. yeah. It's like a travel, he's like a travel and photographer sort of account. But I mean, just even one of the things that he said, which is, you know, just make sure that your pictures are like always high quality. Like, and sometimes you want to post something because you're like, this photo is pretty good. And then you post it and it really changes how people respond to it. Even if it's just like a tiny bit pixelated or just uh-huh. like often quality, it's a big difference. And so that's what I mean by like, it sounded like such a simple tip, but like now that's like always in my head. And so sometimes if I'm like, I'm going to post this and I look at the photo, I'm like, no, the photo's really so hard. The lighting's not right. Like it's always the right move to like not do it until you can do it right. You know? It's funny. Cause if, if I'm in a position with friends and I'm like, Oh, this would be a good picture of me. I want, I want to get this picture. And I'm like, Hey, can you take a picture of me? And the, they'll pull out their phone. I'm like, well, which, which iPhone is this? So like, it's a seven. I'm like, here, I, I wish, does anyone have an 11? <laughs> um, you know, but I'll be like, here, use my 10 at least. Um, but it really, it's like, it, it can pick that up and it does hurt the potential reach to not have as quality of an image. Yeah. And also just even dimensions, you know, I know that you've talked about like really using the full scale portrait mode versus like the squares, right. Or like the horizontals, like they just don't do as well. Even if you have an amazing horizontal picture that you want to post, it takes up this tiny little space when people are scrolling and they're just going to scroll right past it. And so it's really about getting people's attention because attention is the premium that people are selling on Instagram. And how are you going to capture people's attention and how are you going to give them value in a way that is different and stands out from everybody else out there? Cause it is becoming more and more of a crowded space. And you always have to think about how can I bring this to the next level? I remember you had another guest who I really love the tip of, you know, she was a fitness expert and she would have little tags on all of her videos so that even when you're just looking at her page, it'd be like arms, legs, abs, you know, so you know, before you even click what you're going to get. And that's the kind of thing I think people need to do on social media. If you're a personal brand is like, what are people going to get? when they see your page? Like, are they going to see that one photo and be like, this is why I need to click on it and read the caption. Like it captivates me enough that I want to read more. But uh-huh. if just a picture of you standing on the sidewalk. I mean, that's not going to. You might open it. If the first sentence is like awesome and like all caps with emojis, like then maybe, but. 
be. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times not because there's going to be other things that are much more interesting to watch. So you've grown most of your following from posting, which is great. Uh, some of it has also come from just external traffic. Yes. And it's all about trying to convert the external traffic. I know that you had some episodes where you talked about like how to calculate those numbers so that you know how much you're converting and like what's a good number to aim for. And I think that it's always important to keep doing those analyses on yourself and to do those analyses on your, on your profile. Like this, this is a post that works for me. Like, and then continuing to like retool that and making it better. But for me, I think it's really about the idea that ever since I've been doing more media, um, especially with the book and with the TV shows and being on other people's podcasts and even being quoted in articles, you know that people are going to search your account. And what do you want people to see when they come? And can you get that follow? Like once they find it, are they just going to click away or they're going to look and say, oh yeah, this person brings a lot of value. I'm going to follow them for a while and see how I like it. Right. And mm -hmm. I think it's always thinking about what's going to make somebody follow because everybody's following so many people now. It's just harder to get that follow. And unless you're really thinking about how you're going to be different and, and how you're going to be a leader in your market, it's really hard to get a follow. I think it's harder to get a follow now than it was like a year or two ago. Absolutely. I mean, you can look at just TikTok where it's like, when you go over there, you're like, I'm following zero people, whatever, you know, like I'll figure it out later if I want to unfollow. And now it's like, I'm on here too much. I got to, you know, unfollow people, if anything. So yeah. I think that's a good tip is that the name of the game, especially for personal brands nowadays is fixing your follower conversion ratio, even more so than how do I get more profile visits? Yeah. Um, and obviously, because you have such a presence off of Instagram, like you have a blue check mark, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you that you have to have like multiple publications about you off Instagram to get. Um, so that's already, um, you know, testament right there that you have external traffic coming to your profile. So let's put ourselves in the position of a personal brand that says, okay, content check. And, um, you know, my bio is awesome and everything. They're basically doing everything else that we've talked about on the podcast so far there, but they're like, okay, profile visits, not there. What would you do uh, apart from the audiences that you have? What's something that you do that you would recommend to like any personal brand out there? It's a good question. You know, I mean, I think that I've, I've experimented with a lot of different things. I've considered a lot of different things. And some of the things that I find are helpful is posting when you are um, writing a caption. Um, instead of saying, click the link in bio, no one's going to click the link in bio when they're done reading your caption. So you have to basically quote yourself, like click the link at Dr. Judy Ho, like put it right there so that like they can actually click at that point in a caption to go to your profile and then see what you're about. Because, because I am using hashtags and sometimes a hashtag will, these hashtags will get me like 40% of people were not following you and they found your post to, for them to actually go to your profile and follow you you want to make it easy for them. So like, that's one thing that I definitely do is like in the middle of the caption, I'll be like, Hey, if you really like this, check out more tips at Dr. Judy Ho. And then it's already written in. So all they have to do is click on that. And the other thing that I recommend is I do follow some big accounts in the wellness space and I get notifications when they post. And so when I see that they have posted, I'll go right to the post so that I can be maybe one of the first people who writes on that post and I'll write something thoughtful and I'll contribute to the conversation. And I found that sometimes people will follow me after that because obviously it's a, an account that's way bigger than mine. That's in the wellness and motivation space. I've said something that sounds interesting and then people will then go click on my name and then, oh, she has a blue check mark. Oh, she does wellness stuff. Maybe I'll follow her. And I think that that actually pays a lot more dividends than like, I know that there's been other strategies where it's like, go and like comment on the followers of people. I think that's, that's so hard though, because it's like a one-to-one -one strategy. You get like one yeah. person. Yeah. Um, I've also tried those engagement groups and I know that, you know, you've tried them and then you're like, oh, they're not 
doing quite as well as you would think they do. And I would say that that's the same for me. I've tried several different engagement groups. And what happens is people just lose interest. Like you'll look at the engagement group, there's like 30 people on them and only like three people are active. So I haven't really found that to be as helpful. It'll so be I the ones who just joined the group. <laughs> I'm like, cool, what do I do? All right. And then after like, all right, after three months of like, like every one of the photos that everyone posts in this group, it gets old. Yeah. And then my third big strategy, which has worked really well, is promoting other people's stuff on my story. So I don't post it on my actual feed posts, but I'll find other people who are doing great things who I genuinely like their stuff. Like I like their infographic or I like the recipe they posted or whatever. And I'll, I'll, I'll reshare their post but I'll share it in my story because it's only 24 hours and it's like the perfect space. And I also tag them in it. Sometimes people think that if they reshare something, the person will automatically know they don't. You have to actually write their actual handle mm -hmm, so that they can. Mm -hmm. And then I'm very authentic about it. I'll be like, I love this chef and how she's making vegan food sound good. Ha ha. Right. Cause I'm not a vegan. And I'm like, that's awesome that she's making vegan food. Amazing. And those people have big accounts. Usually I do that for people who have like really good influence. And then sometimes they'll like shout you back. They'll like restory it, you know, and say, thank you, Dr. Judy Ho for shouting me out. And then you find that other people have been clicking on your sticker and they follow you from that. Mm -hmm. So it worked out really well for me. And I try to do that at least once a week, if not twice, where maybe it's like a theme, like, oh, today's meditation theme. And then I'll find like three really big meditation gurus in the Instagram, Instagram world. And then I'll shout them out. And then usually at least one or two of them will shout me back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably like 50% of people do so, especially since you're verified. And really because you're verified, that's why the commenting strategy works so well. Especially like if you comment on like the main guys of the show the doctors i don't know any of their names so you know who i'm talking about like that that main guy uh like if you comment on all of his stuff like with your verified check mark and then they go back and find you i'm sure that does really well for you like all the bachelor contestants all comments on each other's stuff and right. it is kind of knowing like all right these this person has the followers that i want and then you're doing the shout out you're actually tagging their account which makes it so it's one click for them to click add this post to you their story because they're all looking for content too and you're giving them a testimonial that's what they want to share with their audience so you just gave them the content that they want to share exactly. um so okay that's a great growth strategy there i think that makes a lot of sense especially because you're producing meditation content and you're doing with the meditation people and making it so it's going to match up and keep that follower conversion ratio good yeah, definitely. And I think that it's really about, um, you know, giving back. I mean, it really is like, if you can give back to the Instagram community, they'll obviously give back to you. Right. So like shouting other people out being like, Hey, I'm going to share you with my audience. People definitely respond to that. Um, there's been times when people will say, Hey, do you want to do an Instagram live with me? I'm like, sure. Why not? You know, I mean, it's always just being open to these opportunities to cross promote other people too. There's always space. You know, I think sometimes people think, well, this person is in direct competition with me. Like, no, I mean, there's a million people who do all this stuff. Like it's okay. Like it's okay to shout out somebody else who also does well this stuff. Cause there are a million of you. And actually people do find each other, like you said, from each other's accounts. And they're like, Oh, we like that. They're like friends and they have a relationship relationship and that they actually talk to one another. And I was actually on a podcast, um, for one of the guys that was on your podcast, um, uh, life hacks LA Stefan, he asked me to be on his podcast, you know, so you're like, okay, cool. Kind of cool. Like you learn about each other from other people and then it, and then you like, and then you get to use their content too. And you get to like share their audience. And so I think that is, you got to like be into the whole cooperation strategy. I think that that actually helps a lot being a, a yes man with collaborations. Yes yeah. man slash yes woman. Yeah. Just say yes. If you have the time. And also when you say yes to an uh, IG live, it doesn't mean you have to be on for a whole hour. I mean, you can just say, I have 30 minutes. Let's try it and let's see what happens. And uh -huh. so it really does pay off. I've done a lot of podcasts that they're like, you want to be on? I'm like, yeah. And then they're like, okay, cool. I just started. And I'm like, <laughs> they're like, you know, the episode has like nine plays. I'm like, whatever like so you you start getting a little bit more picky in the end but at that time too the reason why i said yes so quickly is i was like i need experience being interviewed so yeah. regardless of your audience regardless of oh is it the best use of my time i was like i need experience getting interviewed and there's so many times that i did uh speeches throughout 
my sales job, like literally every time there was a speech, I was like, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. Like never got paid. Anything would take me hours of prep. And now I'm like, good thing I did that so that I could be semi smooth when I started the the podcast and now be a little more smooth and it's still a work in progress. But it's like, if I didn't have all of that experience under my belt right now, it would be really difficult. So I was always, I didn't know I was going to start a podcast, but I knew you should probably have speaking as a skill. So just say yes. Um, so yeah, it really is just kind of yeah boiling it back down to the original theme of the episode, even to your Instagram content strategies has just been, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And if it doesn't work, then don't do it anymore. I mean, I've mm-hmm. definitely tried certain content that it just didn't get any traction. And I'm like, okay, well, I tried it three times, used all the hashtags. It was a high quality picture, you know, did it in portrait mode, blah, blah, blah. And it's not working. That's okay. You know, then just don't do it anymore. Try something else. You didn't lose any followers probably from having three posts that weren't great, you know? Uh huh. Uh huh. It's archive stuff, which is what I've done. So, like, if I try a post and it just like isn't, tracking. I'll just archive it after a week. It's like, it's fine. You know, no one's going to even remember it. People don't usually look that deep into your profile anyway. That is a good idea to do actually for like, to improve follower conversion ratio, you can go back through and archive some of the posts that you think are, you know, I was a little off brand with that one. That was a little bit like, I didn't really provide that much value. It didn't get that many likes. Um, but really if you don't think it would help convert someone into a new follower, it is okay to go back through. And I have gone back through and been like, this doesn't match my color theme. I just wanted to repost it so bad, but I'm going to get rid of it now. Cause it just throws off the look of my page. Yeah. And that's a great tip of yours that I've also followed is like just thinking about templates and themes. Like for a long time, I really didn't, but now I'm like, okay, I have a few colors and I'm only going to use these colors on my page. It does make a difference. And you should invest in, if you can't afford somebody who's doing your social media, like I do all of my own. I know that some people like they invest in a graphic designer, but you don't even need that. I mean, there are, inf- there are influencers who make templates, right? For infographics. And then you can buy them and then you can kind of convert them yourself. And it's sort of like DIY from there. And And I think it's just whatever you can do to up your game. I mean, you can't make an infographic very well from scratch. That's okay. Just go and buy some of these template packs from these, uh, from these influencers. Like they're a great way to start doing the whole infographic thing on your own. If you can't afford to pay somebody to do it for you. I'm a good testament with the infographics of them looking like horrible, then like, okay, then like mildly. Okay. And I still am like, Oh, I wish I had that it factor. I do not know. Don't either what it what it is that is not making mine look like you know the true expert ones even even like the real simple ones that just look like that just looks like exactly how it should be you know I'm I'm not sure what I'm missing but um whatever I think uh, I got a lot of podcast listeners not because I had the best audio quality because I recorded the first like 30 episodes on my phone but if your content is good enough at the end of it then it doesn't have to be pretty to do well so again going back to just do what you can yeah, I think it's totally about the content. I, I remember some of those episodes where you're like, I'm driving in my car. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I, I don't have time to do this, so I have to do it while I'm driving. I'm like, how is he recording a podcast while he's driving? Because I don't think I could do that kind of multitasking. That would not work for me. <laughs> you know, I had actually been doing that for years, but I was never recording it for public consumption. I would just, that's how I'd practice my speeches. Cause like the speeches and the sales company would always happen at the end of our sales contest. So I'd be working the entire time and then have a, and then there'd be like sales contest ends on this day. We're going to do the award ceremony. Then you're going to do your speech. So then I would just be like, all right, the only time I can do it is like just driving around while recording and then instantly like deleting it and just kind of practicing. But yeah, a- autopilot as well, or uh, cruise control. Yeah, that I mean again, amazing cuz uh I'm a baby podcaster. I've only had 27 episodes under my belt and I cannot imagine trying to record a podcast and making sense while I'm driving. Like I couldn't do what you did. <laughs> There's probably way more ums than there there should have been. So, yeah, I I don't recommend it, but at the same time, I wanted to be a yes man with it. So, yeah, I you- got started there still a good I mean I remember a very specific one where you're like I'm driving I'm like this is still a very good episode even though he's driving like, so <laughs> sense of providing a ton of value so it doesn't really matter also the sound quality was still pretty good in your car so that was kind of amazing too. okay good good yeah I use like a lot of like noise reduction oh. things like that yeah, yeah yeah those helped out 
Um, but anyways, wrapping up here, obviously you've got the book and then the podcast. Uh, that's where a lot of your energy is going right now. And everyone listening here obviously loves podcasts. Um, tell us uh, just where's your podcast? Where can they find it? So my podcast is everywhere on multiple podcast platforms, including Apple and Stitcher and iHeart and just any one that you probably listen with. The podcast is called Supercharged Life with Dr. Judy. And it's a podcast that's all about scientific and practical tools to improve your life, to have better wellness, to cultivate good habits, to have good motivation, productivity, good relationships. And right now my podcast is a blend of me doing Ask Dr. Judy's where basically people write in or they basically hit me up on Instagram with their questions and I answer them um, using the expert knowledge that I have in terms of like translating scientific tools so that you can improve your life. But I also do interviews on my podcast. And so I've interviewed some amazing people. I've interviewed... Um, I've interviewed um, Paula Abdul. I've interviewed Mark Cuban. Um, just, you know, people who are obviously killing it at life in various ways and basically finding out what's their secret to how they're supercharging their life. And every single episode will end with like a series of practical tips you can use right then to start to improve your life and put it into practice. So it's a passion project of mine. It's been really, really fun to get to meet new people, talk to people about their life journey, and also just find another way to add value and bring value to my listeners. So supercharged life, and you had an episode with Mark Cuban. That's awesome. Do you know what episode number that is? Yeah, that was like episode four. Okay. So my early ones. Did he promote it for you? Yeah, he did. He reposted. He was so great. You know, Mark Cuban's actually a good friend of my little sister. My little sister is a professional poker player, and they met in her uh, poker playing circuit life because Mark Cuban plays just like, you know, for fun. So um, that's sort of how that connection came about. But he is the most down to earth, cool guy. Um, you wouldn't think, you know, again, with somebody who's so busy that he would just have time to do this. And he spent over an hour and a half on the podcast interview. Wow. I know. And I was like, um, I'm not even paying you. So thank do you. You have something to do now. Yeah. yeah. He was so great. Uh, yeah. He just acted like basketball was- is canceled. I'm good. No. <laughs> up early in the pandemic. I'm sure he's super busy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, okay. So it was at the beginning of the pandemic that you were able to get him. Okay. That's funny. It was really good because he was talking about, well, as we emerge from the pandemic, like, what do we have to think about in terms of being entrepreneurs and businesses? And he really was like, it's going to be all about the small businesses. Like it's all about your ideas and people building it from the ground up. He's like, it's not going to be about billionaires like me. It's going to be about every single person who thinks that they're every man and just has an idea. So he was super motivating to listen to. And I know that a lot of your listeners are entrepreneurs. I I think if you listen to that episode, you're just going to like get so excited to go kill it today. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm definitely listening to that episode. Um, So go check out the podcast, guys. Get the book, Stop Self-Sabotage. we got a very special deal running for you guys that I'm going to talk about right after this uh, interview concludes, so stay tuned for then. Um, But Judy, thank you so much for coming on. Any final words that you want to say? Well, thank you, Derek. I'm a big fan, and I think I owe a part of my Instagram success to you. So thank you so much for providing value to me. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. I hated social media when this started. I mean, I really almost despised it, you know, and then realizing that it's such a tool to get good value out to people and also to market yourself and to actually get a good book deal or get somebody to book you to be on their TV show because social media is currency now. So anyway, keep up the great work. Um, It was really fun to get to talk to you today. Yeah. Thanks so much. See you later.